Hi, everybody. Welcome to the room. Um, we'll get started in a few minutes, but I just wanted to invite everyone to say hello in the chat box, tell people your name, where you're from, um, and we'll get started in just a minute. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And please let us know, you know, where you're where you're calling in tonight in the chat. Um, my name is Sia. I use she or her pronouns. I'm going to be moderating tonight's discussion, and I'm calling in from Central Brooklyn. Um, excited to see some a lot of Massachusetts people here. Another person from Brooklyn. Welcome, Kazi. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, and really excited to be here. Hey everybody, thanks for joining. Um, my name's Sia, I'm gonna be moderating tonight's event. Um, I'm just gonna welcome people to put their name and where they're calling in from in the chat. We'll get started with the film and then a really exciting discussion we have planned for you all um, in just a few moments at 8.05. Um, but we're gonna wait a few more minutes for people to join and in the meantime, um, Welcome, welcome. Please introduce yourself and we'll get started soon. We're really excited to be sharing this movie with you tonight. It wouldn't be an exciting event without a little chat mishap. So shout out to Sunshine. Um, and everyone, please do welcome yourself and put your names where you're calling in from, your pronouns in the chat. We'll get started soon. We're also live tonight on Facebook. Um, so I'm going to drop the Facebook live in the chat too. Um, so some folks are here in the Zoom room. Others are live on Facebook. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop that in the chat so that you can share it with your comrades at home. Or if you're also on Facebook and you want to share that, click that share the Facebook link and make sure that people who even aren't in Zoom are are watching us. Um, so you can whip out your phone. You can tweet the Facebook link. You can share the Facebook link. You can you can tag some of our amazing panelists, um, Jabari. Cooperation Jackson, The Descent Magazine, um, DSA. So really excited to get started um, in just a minute. And please invite other people to join us. Okay. Now is the moment. Um, so, all right, my name is Sia, um, and I am a, welcome, thank you everybody so much for being here, and I wanted to welcome you to the third in a series of discussions that we built around Yale Bridges documentary, The Big Scary S-Word, um, that's socialism. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, the issues that the film raises around the question of economic democracy. This event is co-sponsored by the Democratic Socialists of America's Fund, Dissent Magazine, um, the NYC DSA Housing Working Group, and Housing Justice for All, In These Times Magazine, Dollars and Cents, and the Sustainable Econo Economies Law Center. Um, I'm your moderator, so I'm going to be taking you through the discussion tonight, um, and I'm also going to be a panelist, so I'm going to answer some of the questions that y'all have and some of the questions we've prepared after we watch a short clip of the film. Um, my name is Sia Weaver, and I use she, her pronouns. She, her pronouns. I'm based in Brooklyn, um, and I've worked as a tenant organizer, campaign researcher, and housing policy advocate in New York State for over 10 years. Um, I'm from Rochester, New York, upstate New York, and I hold a master's degree in urban planning from NYU. 
Um, and in addition to myself, I am really excited to introduce the other panelists for tonight's discussion on the big scary S word and economic democracy. Um, so first I wanna introduce Ricardo Samir Nunez. Ricardo is a worker cooperative ecosystem development specialist who supports cultural practices, policies, organizations, and systemic changes that allow opportunities for us to all build beyond the interlocking systems of imperialist, white, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. Um, he is currently the director of economic democracy at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, where he co-coordinates educational programs, legal services, policy advocacy, and regional and national ecosystem development to restore human labor to a right relationship with people and planet. Ricardo is a board member of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives and an at-large board member at the California Center for Cooperative Development and the Southern California Focus on Cooperation. So drop a plus sign in the chat or like a little celebration emoji on your screen to welcome Ricardo tonight. We're really excited to, for him to be here and to hear from him. Um, I'm also super excited to introduce to y'all my friend, um, Senator Jabari Brisport, who is a Democratic Socialist State Senator and represents New York's 25th State Senate District here in Brooklyn. He's not my state senator, but I will forgive him for it. And we're working on it. Um, until becoming the first LGBTQ person of color to serve in New York's legislature, he was a public school math teacher. Um, and Kali Akuno is a co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson, which is one of the coolest organizations active fighting for economic democracy in this country. That's not in the script, I just said it because I know it's true. Um, Kali served as a director of special projects and external funding at the mayoral administration of the late Chihuahua Lumbamba of Jackson, Mississippi. He also served as a co-director of the US Human Rights Network, the executive director of the People's Hurricane Relief Fund, PHRF, based in New New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and was a co-founder of the School of Social Justice and Community Development, a public school serving the academic needs of low-income African-American and Latinx communities in Oakland, California. Um, and I want to shout out the staff tonight who are dropping the links for all of these cool orgs in the chat so that you can find out more and get involved, which is why we're all here tonight. Um, so we are going to start. Um, before we hear from the panelists, after we watch the clip um, from the filmmaker of this amazing film. Yael Bridge is an Emmy nominated documentary filmmaker. She produced Left on Purpose, winner of the um, Audience Award at DOC NYC. She's also the director of productions at Inequality Media, who's been making viral videos that tackled the complex political issues and have gained over 100 million views since 2016. She lives in Oakland, California. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to the tech support team, the amazing tech support team, who's going to show us a little clip. Oh, and one more thing before we do that, um, I'm going to ask all the uh, panelists to turn off their video and just to orient everyone to what we're going to do tonight. We're going to watch a clip of the movie. We're gonna hear from Yael. Um, oh, actually, sorry. Yael is gonna introduce the movie. We're gonna watch the movie. Um, and then we're gonna do Q&A, some prepared questions, and we'll hear from some, some, pan, uh, some questions from the audience. <laughs> so thank you so much, and I'll pass it to Yael. <laughs> okay, I'm introducing now. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, no, nope, happy to do whatever. Um, my name is Yael, as you said, I live in Oakland, um, and I'm the director and producer of The Big Scary S Word, um, which is a documentary about the history and resurgence of socialism in the United States. And um, it's a film that I worked on for several, several years, and I am excited to be able to have this panel conversation with you guys about how, you know, what how we can fix the world because there's a lot uh, to work on. Uh, so we'll look at the clip now and then I guess um, we'll take it from there. Awesome, and I just wanted to make sure, you know, give you a chance to, to answer it. Um, what brought you to make this film about socialism in this historical moment and why is it so important that we're doing this right now? Sure. Um, well, I there are many reasons why I started making this film. I've been working in political films 
um, for my whole professional career. Um, and then I guess uh, it seemed like several years ago, there was a real shift, right? There were millions of people who voted for Bernie Sanders in the 2016 primary who didn't know what socialism was. That was a word, you know, they were like, oh, I don't know what this means, but I'm really into his policies. And that felt like a real shift, right? Like there were suddenly people that this word wasn't a huge turnoff. So I knew something was going on. Um, and indeed something was going on and is still happening um, right now. So the genesis was really like trying to figure out what was going on, what did this word mean for so many people that was either stigmatizing or really attractive. Um, and then also my secret motive was just to get my parents away from saying, you know, oh, I like these ideas, but it's unrealistic. Like we gotta be practical and, you know, voting for these socialist ideas isn't really practical. Um, and so um, I wanted to make a, a film that you'd be able to say like, oh no, here, watch this, what you're saying, you know, it doesn't actually, that's the thing that's impractical. It's not socialism. It's like anything but socialism. Um, and yeah, so then here we are. Here we are. Thank you. Um, and thanks for sharing that. You know, it's not even a secret motive, right? Everyone has a personal reason why they're coming to this work. Um, and I'm really excited to be in this work with everyone on this panel and you as well. So let's take it away. Um, we're going we're gonna to watch a little clip of this film and we'll do some Q&A. And so please write down some questions before we go. Panelists, please turn off your videos and your mics and let's do it. Conventional businesses, they are legally required to maximize shareholder return. And if they are not doing that, then the shareholders can sue the board of directors or the CEO to get their profit. We need an entire shift of our economy, but a fundamental part of that is worker ownership. Once we have workers in control of the businesses that they are in every day, then they can start making different decisions about how those businesses are run. The central feature of socialism and its difference from capitalism is you could organize the workplace democratically. We vote for mayors and governors and presidents, but we go to work five days a week. We cross the threshold into the factory, the office, or the store, and we cede all power to a tiny group of people whose names we often don't even know, who make the decisions that are in every way more crucial to our lives. In the United States, there's somewhere between 400 and 600 worker cooperatives. There's a large proportion of worker cooperatives in the retail industry, so cafes, grocery stores, there's construction cooperatives, there's home care cooperatives, house cleaning cooperatives, research and design cooperatives. More participation from workers actually benefits the bottom line. Every morning, <laughs> about 30 minutes. No matter if I'm off or not, every day. Just kind of get the wrinkles out, crease the arms, make sure the collar is crisp. I'm a worker owner, so I am an employee, but I'm also an owner. It makes me more excited to work because I'm involved. How are you? <laughs> well, my previous job before coming to work for Evergreen, I couldn't see a beginning and end to it. It was just come do a specific job and go home here. If you do so much work, you could drive up the profit. If, if you have so much profit at the end of your fiscal year, you get a check. The genesis of Evergreen started with an economic development uh, strategy initially to just create jobs. It was part of an attempt to lean on large enterprises who spend a lot of money each year on goods and services who are here to stay. There was something north of $2 billion a year being spent outside the state of Ohio, and in some cases outside the country, 
And so Evergreen was designed to give these larger businesses options to buy local. Here, a co-op is, a, it's a collective of people who democratically and collectively own our operating companies. Everybody has a share, everybody has one vote. Good afternoon. Good hello, everyone. Oh, hello. Most jobs wouldn't just share the financials with the employee. Here, as you see it from the top to the bottom. Working in co-ops absolutely changes culture. It changes lives. Because you're sharing profits, you sort of share workload, you share responsibility. The culture shift is, hey, how can I be more helpful to this person working on the other side of me? By flattening out systems of governance, we can start to see a transformation in both the workplace itself and also the individuals themselves. The foundation of the co-op's mission statement is to build wealth and, you know, financial stability. I'm a first-time homeowner, thanks to Evergreen, and last month, I just paid off the house, so I don't owe a mortgage anymore. I just pay yearly taxes. When you're talking about the benefits of owning a business and creating more opportunity for more people to own businesses and to have control over their lives, if that's not American, I don't know what is. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I want to invite the panelists to turn their videos back on. Okay, cool. How amazing and moving. Um, so now we're gonna go into part one of the panel discussion. We're really anxious to get to as many of your questions as possible. So we've asked the panelists to limit their responses to you know three to five minutes. Um, we're gonna wrap up part one of this section with our prepared questions by around 8.50. And then we're gonna spend the remainder of the time um, with questions from the audience. So in order to ask questions, you can put them in the Q&A section of the chat. Um, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions um, to make sure that they um, come in for the Q&A function, not the chat function. Um, so it looks a little different. There's a little box at the bottom that says Q&A. So please submit questions as they come to you during the discussion and we'll make sure to collect those and we're gonna ask them at the end. Cool? Um, so if you have any tech issues, feel free to drop in the chat and someone from the team will explain to you, but there's a little Q&A there at the bottom. All right, so we're going to take it away. Um, so really, really beautiful clip and beautiful film overall. Um, the clip begins with Ricardo, who's here tonight, explaining to us that under capitalism, conventional businesses are required to operate on the basis of making profit rather than on the basis of accruing um, benefits to workers or the general public. Um, as a result, he says that we need an entire shift of our economy, and a fundamental part of that shift is worker ownership over businesses. Um, in the rest of the clip, various commenters touch on how this works both in theory and practice and um, how it really changes people's lives. Um, so, Ricardo, I want to start by asking you, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the panel, um, how and why worker cooperatives are a necessary step to move us beyond capitalism and towards true economic democracy. Thanks, Sia. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I'll just start wherever I start. Um, so, so I think part of it is that um, as, you know, probably uh, mostly leaning towards socialist or some type of left perspective from the folks um, who are here attending today. And I think for me, part of it is trying to figure out practical steps as we are moving towards that socialist future um, or that more humanistic um, future. And so cooperatives, worker cooperatives, uh, for me, that's, that's my jam. And worker cooperatives provide a space um, for people to actually practice in a, in a daily lived experience way that deep democracy that I think we're all going to have to like flex our muscles um, to be able to participate in a future society that is actually requiring a lot more participation from us. Um, and so as we're looking at 
like the future of labor, automation, climate catastrophe, and the lessons that we've learned from this past or the, the pandemic that we're still in. It's like, how, what are the lessons that we can learn from all of those pieces? Um, and for me, uh, cooperatives provide people a space to start stepping into that future. And also for us to start thinking about different ways and of relating to the workplace different ways of relating to innovations in um, automation. Like why, why isn't it that um, instead of automation, meaning that people are, are losing jobs and not able to support themselves or their families, but that automation provides people with more space to participate civically or just to take a step back and like recognize that for the majority of our history as human beings on this planet, this was not how we functioned and it it is like literally and figuratively killing us um and so i think worker cooperatives allow us to start to practice these these ways of being in relationship to each other and really having to confront difficult conversations with each other and confront the contradictions that we're all swimming in um in our current society so yeah so that's a little bit about like from from my perspective just how we Worker cooperatives provide that stepping stone, and this isn't even talking about other ways of like decommodifying um, land and housing and um, and creating more just food systems um, and, and all of those different pieces that are definitely part of an integrated whole. So, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Awesome, thank you. Um, I want to call on Jabari next to share your thoughts. Sure. I'll say that worker cooperatives offer an incredible stepping stone for many people who are just at the cusp of wanting to abolish capitalism or, or become anti-capitalist themselves. And I say that because uh, before I was elected, I would often do workshops with DSA's Afro-Socialist Socialist of Color Caucus, where we would go and speak with um, youth various communities, black and brown youth, and we would do a workshop over the life cycle of a Jordan sneaker. And we would um, pretend we would work with a, a theoretical $100 sneaker and assign them roles in the supply chain. Like you are the other uh, Bangladeshi worker, you work at the docks, you work in customs, you are the CEO, you were marketing, so on and so forth. And as they started to learn um, how little of the sneaker or the, the, the wealth of the sneaker that the, the wealth created goes to the workers itself they would start to say something you might hear a lot which is people saying you never you can never make any money working for someone else and they would start to say well then we need to be the boss right or you know we need more black owned businesses and we need to be the boss and then we could intercept and say okay well how does that actually change the dynamic if you just replace one boss with another and you are the boss and they would say well that's that's what it is you know dog eat dog world you are either the worker or you are the boss which is kind of what capitalism makes people think which is that it must be eat or be eaten kill or, or be killed that there are no other options but we could bring up worker cooperatives which they consistently had never heard about and say what if rather than worker boss dynamic you could cooperatively own and cooperatively make decisions and we seeded um that idea over and over again and it's a, a very powerful way to just let people know that it is not we don't need to live in the false dichotomy of capitalism of you know i I've, i'm either the boss or the worker there is something that's cooperative and collective That's an amazing, uh, that's an amazing story. And I really want to see that workshop. It sounds like it's really effective at bringing young people into socialism. Um, Callie, do you want to share your thoughts with us? Sure, I'll just try to pick up on a couple of things that's been, been said um, and just, just add on to it if, if I can. Um, and what I would say is that cooperatives are our school for day-to-day -day minute to minute democracy, right? And if we want to really democratize society, and let's be clear, we don't live in a democracy. Like most of us don't really understand what the democratic functioning and operations of society really entails. We call what we live in, or, or those who set up this settler colonial project call what we live in uh, a, a democracy. Um, but you know, uh, I think as Rick so often puts it, Rick Wolf, 
where we spend what either half or some some of us you know more than two-thirds of our life we really don't have that much of a democratic say we don't have a say at all fundamentally uh and if that is the fundamental basis by which society is reproducing itself uh then we don't live in a democratic society we just need to come to accept that so how do we get there right um it's not just going to be through the ballot box that we get there. We have to transform all the different relations of how we both reproduce ourselves and produce the goods and services that we need to survive in society. This is where worker co-ops, I think, play an essential role, right? In re-articulating how we understand ourselves in relationship to each other and understand our relationship to the material world, both of which we know have to fundamentally change uh, if we're going to survive, if we're going to get rid of uh, all of the bad habits and the bad practices and the bad system, which are destroying the, the ecosystem, which are destroying uh, our, our community relations. Um, and this is where I think we on a practical level in, in our society can start the democratic school of worker democracy uh, at that point of production. But I think we need to be clear, and this may get into another point, Worker cooperatives and cooperatives in general are necessary, but they aren't sufficient to get us to where we really need to go towards source, to socialism. So they are a building block, but there's some other things that we're going to need to really uh, move to the society of associated producers uh, in a decommodified society, right? Because we have to recognize as they currently kind of operate without the broader systems of support that Ricardo was, was speaking to, we're still basically within a worker co-op framework, a co-op framework, still dealing with a commodified aspects of society. And we're gonna to have to go deeper and figure out how to do that collectively to get us to the next stage of where we need to go. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thanks so much for everybody's thoughts. I am not a worker cooperative person, but I'm still happy to be here tonight. I work um, in housing and that's you know my field. and. And you know, you just shared that people spend two thirds of their life, right, um, in the workplace in a place where they have no democratic control over what really happens there. The sad thing is that they spend the other third of their life in their house. And unless they're like a property owner and a property owner free and clear of a mortgage, we also really don't have too much control over what happens there either. Um, so our inability to control um, the, the resources that we earn at work, but also the, um, the land value of where we live really hold us back from being able to have a full and functioning democracy, as Callie put it. Um, and I also completely agree, right, that as it stands right now, the sort of limited examples of both worker cooperatives and things like community land trusts or limited, limited equity cooperatives or housing cooperatives are still functioning in that same highly commodified market. Um, so they're subject to some of the exact same constraints that uh, a traditional business might look like. Um, but I also want to just name that one of the reasons why we care so much about this is that the cooperatives and the, the, the cooperatives are how we're like creating the democratic structures that are necessary for the reforms that we want to win to be both effective because people believe in them and durable because people believe in them, right? So big public institutions that nobody believes in that have no functioning democracy or as, as Callie put it, you know, People don't believe we live in a democracy. They don't believe in the public institutions that exist. They see the state as something that um, polices them, not as something that is abundant and caring for them and something that they have control over how it, how it, um, how it makes decisions to allocate resources. Um, that is a huge barrier to the world that we wanna see. And so this fight for cooperatives, um, both in the workplace and at the home is really important as a really important building block to sort of rebuilding trust in our democratic institutions and creating those democratic institutions in people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and we can't do anything without those. Um, that's what we need in order to, to, to win socialism. Um, so the next question I wanna take from here is I wanna ask the panelists to expand further and discuss how worker cooperatives along with other economic reforms, such as public banking, guaranteed work and housing, how are these necessary but not sufficient conditions for the economic transformation that we are seeking as socialists? Um, so first I'm gonna kick this one over to Jabari and then we'll hear from Callie. 
Yeah, sure. I would say one reason why cooperatives may be necessary but not sufficient is that, you know, to me, socialism is about taking care of, of everyone. And well, that also includes those who, who cannot work because they are, you know, old or, or, or differently abled or they're, they're too, too young to work. You know, I, I'm in, in the state Senate in New York, I'm the chair of children and families and I, I do a lot of legislation around childcare. But if we are truly gonna build a robust society that works for everyone, in addition to democracy in the workplace, in our political arena, we need to ensure there are policies such as progressive taxation um, and universal policies that are able to affect everyone regardless of, of their employment status. Cool, thanks Jabari. And Jabari is an amazing state senator in Brooklyn. I wanna pass it over now to Callie. Yeah, a lot to add on to that. Um, where to begin in, in the time we have, because uh, I could talk about that, this one kind of all day long. But um, let me start here. I mean, um, building on the, the necessary but insufficient, one of the critical things that we have to really focus on is not just being a sector of the economy. Right, a lot of the talk about uh, uh, cooperatives that you know, there's the kind of the cooperative sector, or there's the ESOP sector, or you know, etc. Um, and that kind of divorces it from the larger question. If we kind of compartmentalize it, the larger question of worker self organization and worker self management that we have to get to, which then encompasses any and every workplace, whether it's a cooperative now or not, and the organizing that we have to do to get workers wherever they are, be they in a union or not unionized or some form of a worker center or a migrant uh, a form of association. It is our critical task, I think, in this particular point to get the co-op movement in tune and in line with all of the different workers, wherever it may be, to then try to cooperatize with the rest of society and to organize and try to push and encourage everybody to turn wherever they are working into a cooperative. That way then we could associate with each other, confederate with each other, and then do a level of coordinated dialogue planning to work both within the needs of our communities, but also within the needs of the, the ecology, right? So that we don't overproduce, uh, we don't produce things that are, that are kind of superfluous to uh, where we are at and where we need to go, that we can kind of from the, from the bottom up uh, start to really rationalize how we're going to tackle uh, CO2 production, methane production, et cetera, and that we put this in subjected to democratic control, not to some kind of market response or, or, or market force and those who control these kind of limited and controlled spaces, that we put that to a collective decision, right? And But we could only do that if every single worker or the greatest number of workers are involved in some form of democratic organization where they can federate and make direct decisions about production, distribution, consumption, and reuse and recycling, right? Or and or repurposing. So this is a critical piece of why I think it is necessary for the, for the totality of the socialist project to not just see ourselves as a sector, but to see ourselves as a piece of what it's going to take to reorganize all of society and move it towards democratic self-organization. Yeah, thank you. I really um, I really appreciate that. And speaking just a little bit about, again, like the sort of housing cooperative sector. In New York, where I'm based, we have a lot of shared equity co-ops, limited equity co-ops where working class people live um, and have an ownership stake in their, in their housing. Um, and they're separate from the sort of renter model the rent stabilized model, the rent controlled model, they're separate from our public housing, but it's a small sector. It's a small component of the affordable housing universe. And that means that they are operating under the same exact constraints and using the same exact financing tools as much of the other housing. And it makes it harder to scale. Um, it makes it feel riskier to policymakers. And, you know, I think, co-ops are incredibly important for sort of creating these democratic structures, but unless we can figure out how to scale them, unless we can set the, um, unless we can set the terms on which 
we are willing to like get capital and operating subsidies for co-ops to function. So we don't have to play by the rules that are actually set by finance and not set by, you know, us ourselves. They're not going to really be able to provide affordable housing on much different terms than some of the existing affordable housing projects that we have. Um, so that's maybe like a little bit wonky, but the, the reality is, is that co-ops are the ultimate thing that we need to create the democratic institutions that can control our homes, um, but they need to be able to scale. And until they're scaling at the level that Callie is talking about, they are going to be facing some of the exact same problems that other affordable housing models or sort of worker ownership models are facing. You're going to struggle to get resources. You might in a co-op, and this is, it pains me to say this, I don't want to say it, um, but if you're in a co-op, because it's harder for you to get access to financing because you're sort of working under with sort of less access to resources, honestly, and in a more isolated model and a more isolated sector of the economy, it might be actually more important for you to pursue an eviction because that eviction of one person is going to destabilize your entire cooperative at a level that might not be true to a sector that is bigger. Um, one person doesn't matter as much. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue cooperatives. It actually means that we should pursue them more aggressively. It means that we need more of them so that the risks are mitigated and so that we can actually be running housing on our values with the worker and like people control over both the land resource and the housing resource and the sort of economic gains that come with owning land and housing in New York. Um, but right now it's seen as too risky and it's seen as too different. And that's what we need to overcome in order to like build those institutions that we really have for this model to work. And it is because it is so critical to get us into that into that future. Um, so I will pass it to Ricardo to answer this question too. Thanks. Yeah, that's um yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think what the, at least what I've seen and what I've heard, there's a great um, metaphor that I heard from Gopal Dayaneni, who was uh, with the Movement Generation, um, and talking about how the pandemic created this zero gravity moment where everything was thrown up in the air. And, and so people are trying to figure out where to position things so that when they fall back down to earth, there's a new positionality, um, both with power, resources, et cetera. Um, and so when I'm thinking about the barriers that C is talking about around financing, scaling, all of those pieces, um, I, there, I was seeing already an interest in different cooperative models, um, worker cooperatives from a perspective of the last financial crisis and trying to figure out how can we create more stability in our communities. Um, I'm from California, so the housing crisis, how can we create more stable, long-term, um, permanently affordable community-controlled housing? So there's more politicians who are looking to um, cooperative models and land trusts as a way to mitigate that harm and create more stability. Um, and this is all to say that I, I think that there is um, the contestable space for power has shifted. And our movements and our people, we need to be acting and working together in concert. And that doesn't mean that we have to always agree with each other. It doesn't even <laughs> mean we have to agree on each other's strategies and tactics necessarily, or which one is more important than the other, but that they're all needed. Um, and so we need to like at least tolerate each other's different strategic frameworks when trying to take this step towards um, this, this future that we're all trying to build. Um, and then to the piece around uh like i don't know the about um what are how is this not sufficient and etc um around these different models that we're talking about what what where i go with that is what can we learn from places that have already scaled these models we look at mondragon cooperatives in um, spain where they have tens of thousands of worker owners and hundreds of um, workplaces that are worker owned and controlled and um, what has happened there well one of the criticisms there is that the worker owners and the cooperative mondragon cooperatives themselves kind of separated from the rest of the labor movement in spain and there's a critique that there's a labor aristocracy because you have this sort of bubble where um, these communities and corporations created the opportunities for the workers in their own communities but then left and stepped out of the larger labor structure um, struggle 
Um, when we talk about housing cooperatives and land trusts, a lot of the way that those have been built have been sort of piecemeal and like individual um, houses and, and properties. And so how do we scale those things? Well, historically in the United States, housing cooperatives, when they expanded and scaled, it was because of federal funding and different um, mechanisms for creating permanently supportive, um, permanently affordable housing, as opposed to now where most of it is tax and tax incentives. So um, I think there's a lot of different ways that we are going to need to um, activate, mobilize, um, and contest for power, as well as organize on smaller scale, um, in smaller scale ways. Thanks, Ricardo. And thanks for bringing in this current moment of the pandemic, where I think a lot of our assumptions about how society is supposed to operate have sort of been like thrown into disarray. Um, it's been a really painful period and a period of, you know, a lot of loss. Um, but at the same time, we've seen a willingness for deep government intervention to reduce poverty. Um, the biggest ex uh, expansion of rental assistance in decades, the biggest expansion of direct cash subsidies to people in decades, the child tax credit, which I'm sure Jabari can talk more about, but it's just, you know, an amazing um, cash transfer to folks. So there's just been a real willingness in the face of the pandemic to say, you know, things actually don't have to be this way. Um, and an opportunity for organizers who believe in a different system to push forward a different kind of relationship between resources, whether they're land or whether they're jobs and businesses um, and the people who work in them. Um, so in housing, we've really experienced that with the eviction moratorium, um, but there's lots of other examples too. So I wanted to sort of ask, you know, how the current historical moment, particularly this pandemic, and also the self-evident um, impacts of climate change on every way that society is operating, how have they made it clear that capitalism is not capable of this kind of economic transformation that we and the planet need to survive and what sort of opportunities have, have come up? And so I'm gonna start by asking Callie that. Another one that we could talk all day about, just have a conversation. No, all of this, all of this. <laughs> um, there's a couple of different things I think we need to really um look at number one i think the pandemic uh clearly demonstrated that some of these um arguments about where the tech sector is and how dominant in this in the economy uh that it allegedly was uh were i think clearly demonstrated to be overstated right and overcooked um, now, that doesn't mean, at least in my view, uh, that the tech sector is not becoming stronger. I think it is becoming uh, profoundly strong. I actually agree with, with uh, uh, was it some of uh, Barrel Falco's arguments about them uh, now structuring uh, critical aspects of the market itself. I think that uh, that is becoming true. But what we saw during the pandemic, uh, if we looked at and we analyzed what didn't stop, Right uh, at at any juncture of the pandemic, what didn't stop? What sectors, you know, uh, 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 you know, couldn't quit, uh, and who was literally forced to work during those conditions to, in order to force society to function? So critical parts of agriculture never stopped. Critical part of you know uh, uh, meat packing and, and warehousing never stopped. Critical aspect of longshore work and transportation work never stopped. Uh, we saw, you know, uh, Amazon become even more dominant uh, in the economy and ramp things up uh, and how this kind of uh, logistics sector became uh, much more, more critical and important. Um, now, I'm, I'm bringing all of these particular pieces up because these are all areas uh, uh, in many respects that I think uh, with a major combined fight between unions and co-ops, Right and worker center, we developed a comprehensive, diversified strategy. I agree with Ricardo on that point, right? Because uh, I can tell you some things that may work in Mississippi may not work in in New York, and vice versa in terms of uh, uh, effective strategies to get to point A to point B. Uh, but if we can come up, I think, with a comprehensive strategy that combines the uh, the, the you know workers in this co uh, coherent way. 
uh, on a state by state basis, on a regional basis, then on a national basis. Uh, I think we can do some critical transformation of the economy, drawing from the lessons and then the repositioning that has happened during the pandemic. Uh, and another thing, you know, for me, I've, I've been happy in this case to be, at least in the short term, proven wrong. Um, and what do I mean by that? I was making some arguments, you know, through through a coalition vehicle that we helped put together called the People Strike, that. Um, capital's hands, the employer's hands were going to be profoundly strengthened by how the pandemic was being managed by Donald Trump, right? And this whole uh, forcing people back to work much sooner than what the situation actually re required and much sooner than what society could actually bear in terms of distributing resources. Like we actually did have, you wanna look at it, we had a mini experiment, maybe about a six month experiment uh, with a form of UBI, universal, you know, uh, uh, basic income. Uh, it wasn't full blown, wasn't full throttle by any, you know, stretch of the imagination. Uh, uh, and they did far more subsidizing the financial markets than they did us uh, at every juncture of the road. But there was a little experiment in that which demonstrated the capacity of the state to be able uh, to roll out something such as this and for it to be highly successful and meet many needs. Uh, and I think a part of that, not for the same reason that the right argues for it, but I think a part of that demonstrated that labor's hand and, and a, a broad sense of, um, I wouldn't call it class consciousness, but a certain level of self-consciousness about uh, our role in the economy has been stimulated and awakened. And now you, you have, um, uh, let me make it practical. So like in Mississippi, uh, we waged a, or at least I was in, involved in, in, in went on longer than that, but about a 10 year campaign uh, to win, you know, $15 an hour, right? Uh, uh, the fight for 15. And we made a little noise here and there in the campaign, did some good organizing work, but the pandemic in, in, in a short year, basically won uh, a $15 an hour wage in Mississippi where 10 years of organizing could not, right? Because of the shortage that that has taken place of, of many workers uh, choosing their health and their family uh, over coming in and being subjected to uh, uh, the pandemic uh, is a real thing. And I think this is some critical lessons, organizing lessons and lessons around the transformation of consciousness that we're really going to have to tap into, I think, if we're going to move a, a, a radical agenda forward and not just have it be subjected to spontaneity. So there's a lot of work that's going to have to go into that. I mean, and I'm, I'm trying to cover a lot in a short period of time. Uh, uh, so excuse me for if I'm just touching on things and, and jumping on some other stuff, but um, uh, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. I think both summarizing what's happened in the last year and a half and really doing analysis of where our power lies, uh, given the, the strategic leverage that we had and we employed at different points at the time during the pandemic in the key areas of the, of the economy that did not stop and could not stop. Yeah, each of these questions are like really intense and we could have a whole panel discussion about them. Um, thank you so much. I think that there's so many um, analogies too with the housing movement um, that I won't get into right now, but we can talk to, um, we can talk a bit more later in the, in the discussion just about evictions and how we've been able to stop evictions during the pandemic in a way that we never really thought was possible before. The one thing I do wanna say, right, is that, um, once you give somebody something, it's really hard to take it away. Um, so you give someone ownership over their land or their housing, or you give someone ownership over their business, or you say, hey, you can't be evicted because there's a public health crisis. And I know you can't pay rent, but we're not gonna evict you anyway because housing is a human right. Um, and it's really hard to take that away. Once the people know that when there's enough pressure, the government's going to intervene to protect their human rights. It's really hard to say, you know, we're actually not going to do that anymore. They'll do it. But um, I think that there's been a way in which people have like awakened to the idea that we could have a more abundant approach to land and to resources than we've had historically. And I hope that there's like massive organizing opportunity in, in that. Um, Ricardo, I want to go to you next on this question and then Jabari, and then we'll go to the last question before we open it up for panelist discussion. Sure, yeah. Um, I think the um, one thing that comes to mind around this question um, 
that capitalism is not capable of the kind of economic transformation that we need um, and the planet needs to survive. Um, what, it, what it brings up for me is the policy work that we've been doing at the Sustainable Economies Law Center with others around the country uh, around pushing for um, more support for worker cooperatives, for housing cooperatives, for land trusts, um, for community-owned renewable energy, um, is that when we're in the meetings with politicians, they don't know what to do. Like, they are out of ideas. And it's not in a way of like, they, they're explicit now that the ideas, their traditional responses to all of these crises are not working. And so if you're in a space where you have a politician who's looking for these types of answers um, or looking for alternatives, we found that um, over the last few years, there's been city councils, um, uh, what was it, state um, at the state level at, and at the federal level, all of these different um, folks who are needing these answers and needing to connect with people who have some experience in either participating in them um, or supporting the development of them. So I think that's something that I've seen that's, that's heartening for me. Um, and that's like Kali was saying, there's, it's context based on the different strategies that you're going to employ. But in California, we've been successful in convincing in um, multiple cities, mostly in the Bay Area, but a couple in Southern California as well, to actually provide funding, um, small amounts for the city, but $100,000 um, or, or $200,000 over multiple years to start funding um, the conversion of existing workplaces to worker cooperatives. Um, so like Sia was saying, uh, when somebody has something, it's really hard to give it away. There's this um, metaphor that I think of, um, you have to give a wolf um, some meat if you want to take away the bone. And so, uh, so that's like one of the things that we're trying to figure out is um, how do we shift these, um, how do we shift these systems in a way that the wolves don't attack us as we're trying to do it. And at some point also we're probably just going to have to fight. So um, yeah, so that's what comes up for me with, with this question. Thanks, Sia. Yeah, there's no way they're not going to fight us. They're definitely going to fight us. They just are. Even when you take a little bit, they, they fight back hard. Um, which Jabari can tell you. I'm going to pass it to Jabari and then we'll go on to our last, our last question before opening it up to the audience. Sure. So I would say in the political moment we have now, just looking at the responses and living through the pandemic, it's become more and more apparent for a lot more people how different uh, the lives of the, the wealthy are. Um, if I can speak to one example being that with so many people during this pandemic losing their jobs or their livelihoods, um, losing access to food security or worried about being evicted, a lot of socialists and progressives, we put it front and center that the wealthy had increased their wealth, that billionaires had gotten billions of dollars or actually nationwide over a trillion dollars richer during the pandemic when everyone was supposedly struggling. And in New York, we pushed really hard on a big tax the rich and invest in our New York campaign and specifically honing in that over and over again that New York's billionaires had increased their net worth by over $77 billion during, during the pandemic while others had lost their, their jobs and their livelihoods. We were able to win massive new um, taxes on, on the wealthy to in, invest into working class social programs, billions of dollars, not, not anywhere near what we wanted. We were shooting for 50 billion and I think we won 4.5, which was far from what we wanted, but also the largest increase in New York's history. So uh, we're, still, we're still proud of, of the work we did. Uh, I would say the other main uh, distinction we saw between the lives of everyday New Yorkers and the wealthy is back when the pandemic was at its worst. I know it had different peaks in different parts of the country. In New York, in New York City, it was right at the beginning, like late March, April was the worst. And when the crap hit the fan, the wealthy just up and left and went to their second homes in, in Westchester or, or another state or, or, or wherever. And it made it very clear to us how they respond to threats, to existential threats and how they respond to, I know climate change was mentioned earlier, how they respond to climate change when the sea levels rise and they'll just pack up and leave and go to their second or third home in a, in a safer spot. You know, we just came through um, Hurricane Ida 
where you know some people in New York uh, died because they were living in basement apartments that flooded. You know, the opposite experience of someone that was fine in their penthouse. So we've seen class struggle be a lot more sharpened in the sense of people understanding that the wealthy live very clearly different lives than we do that are much uh, safer. And um, that's been helpful for awakening people's consciousness. And then just going back to what Sia mentioned about um, just winning these uh, protections from e evictions, that that was a working class battle from the, the housing movement and socialist legislators that said that if housing is indeed a human right, and this is a pandemic, then we have to guarantee people's right to stay in their homes. And we can't um, we can't let people be evicted uh, for me reasons completely out of their control, which are a global pandemic and, and, and nearly everyone uh, losing their jobs. Thanks, Jabari. I'm ready to open up to the audience. So the first question we want to have from the audience is, you know, um, after all of this, hearing about all this amazing work, um, everything that's going on across the country, um, what actions can organizers take um, to help make the necessary economic transformations that we've talked about a reality? How can someone get involved in fighting for um, economic democracy in their workplace or in their home um, today? Does anyone want to take a stab at answering that? Can, I can start. Um, I would say if the uh, there's a union for you to join in your workspace, please join the union. If there is no union, start a union in your workplace. And if you are already in a union, get more involved, right? How can you uh, get it more militant and ready for when the time being, you may need to strike and withhold your labor in order to extract more from the boss? Uh, when everyone everyone watching gets a chance to watch the full documentary, and it's amazing, there's a, one part that really um, stuck with me, which said that um, in hand in hand, uh, the, the strongest advances in the labor movement only came in, uh, alongside the strongest advances in the socialist movement. Or the, you know, they, they had to work together um, in order to push it. And if we are going to see the changes away from capitalism, we want to see labor and strengthening labor and unions are a big part of that. Thanks, Jabari. Um, yeah, I'll, thank you so much for making this film. Um, and after hearing all of the questions that have come up within the chat, from the discussion tonight, from the three discussion series before this, um, are these the kinds of you know, questions and conversations you hope that the film would raise um, about worker cooperatives, democratic socialism, economic transformation, and capitalism? Is this how you hoped audiences res would respond to the film? And, and what are you hoping? For. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in short, a dream come true. Sorry, I have a lot of like sunlight beating down on me uh, right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you work on something for a long time in a basement by yourself and you only hope for moments like these. Um, and this conversation, I think in particular is really something, I mean, all of these topics are obviously really important to me, but in my specific industry, uh, we're incredibly disorganized. Um, there is not a union that is in documentary. It just actually doesn't exist. And there's uh, unions in, in Hollywood and for fiction films and TV shows and for documentary. Uh, it's just actually historically just like, you know, my friend calls it a rich white man's hobby. And that is uh, just deeply true. And it's, uh, it's a real problem who gets to tell these stories and the people who tell the stories and the media that we consume are, they're just, they're just rich people. That's who can afford to do it. And so it's just really hard uh, to figure out how we can organize, how can we transform? And it's a thing that I think about a lot for my work. I was really lucky um, on this film that there is a production company that is a worker on co-op, Meerkat Media out of New York and they're dear friends of mine. And so, uh, you know, they were able to speak to, you know, help me navigate specifically the, water, the waters of the co-op industry and also just in general, how to make sure we're doing everything equitably. There's so much unpaid labor in the film industry. I could just 
you know, go on and on about how horrible my industry is. But so this topic in particular, like I'm taking notes. It's the thing I've talked to Ricardo about. I'm like, how do I, how can I do this for my own work? Because, you know, there isn't a union that, that I can join, unfortunately. Um, so it is a thing that we are working on documentary producers alliance there's like tons of different people that we're we're trying to so anyway uh yeah that's what i would have to say awesome and i want to give the other panelists a chance too to respond on, on that question of how can people get involved and what conversations should we be having and how does this film help raise those questions you want to go ricardo i can i can pick up either way go for it brother uh, well, I support what Jabari said 100%. Um, uh, if, if that is not within your reach, um, get with some other like-minded folks and start doing, uh, organizing a co-op uh, would be the second thing that, that I would you know, suggest. Uh, but those shouldn't be posed as a poll, like, like just opposed to each other or somehow conflicting to, with each other. I know sometimes they're presented that way, but I think I would make a longer argument that that's the wrong way to present it, uh, that co-ops and uh, labor unions um, historically uh, were conjoined with each other. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a disconnect uh, between them, you know, between the two since kind of the rise of the AFL-CIO and the Gompers kind of model of, of uh, union organizing, but that's not, one that we have to stick with. In fact, a lot of the troubles uh, that uh, organized labor uh, is confronting, I think it would do well to kind of shift some of its focus. So that's a challenge to those uh, in, the, in the audience who may be uh, part of a, a labor union uh, to start thinking about forming more union co-op uh, partnerships and models uh, as a transformative piece. Uh, but then there's some other practical things I think that, uh, we are all, many of us, and I mean many of us like in the millions are already doing, but I think we're just at this juncture of the road failing to connect, uh, to, to kind of aggregate their power and to give them political direction. So uh, to make it practical and concrete, I think there are now millions of this, uh, uh, of us who are doing some form of community gardening, right? Uh, either for our own kind of pleasure or subsidence or some form of kind of market exchange, uh, I think we need to expand that uh, exponentially and then do it in, to the greatest ex extent possible uh, in a planned manner in our communities uh, to be able to meet the caloric needs and the, the first kind of survival needs and then try to scale that up over time uh, to be able to execute local programs of food sovereignty. But that needs to be connected, I would argue, to the deep mutual aid work, which is taking place, uh, particularly since the pandemic, uh, where folks are kind of joining each other kind of actually meet a, a need and a demand, right? Uh, because one of the weaknesses of, of a lot of our mutual aid work, uh, at least in this country, uh, is that it, it is pretty much dependent in the long run upon charity, meaning, um, you know, like some of the stuff we've been doing uh, here the last couple of weeks, and now there's another storm coming through that, that more folks are coming uh, up our way uh, uh, trying to escape, you know, the, the conditions on itself. But one of the things that our mutual aid work is still dependent upon going to Home Depot and going to Lowe's for many essential things. Uh, um, and the one thing that, that uh, we uh, are really drawing home to like our own membership and our own base is that now that we know that these are, these, these hurricanes are now part of the new normal and the 100 year storms are now becoming every year storms. Uh, that we have to step up our food production to, at the very least, be able uh, to meet the need of, of those who are uh, in need of some form of uh, food security, that we are meeting that need through our own productive capacity and not having to go to uh, Sam's Club, giving Walmart more money, or uh, um, uh, giving it to, uh, what's the other one? Um, I, I can't remember, you know, the uh, Costco. <laughs> right, that, um, that uh, we have the capacity to be able to produce and do our own level of food servicing at this stage, stage of the game, how we've kind of emerged from the pandemic, that we should be thinking about how do we store up and save up to be able to, to provide mutual aid on that level 
where we're not engaging in kind of a commodified production, but in direct aid and, and trade, you know, with other communities uh, based upon our combined needs. Um, um, so these are a number of different things that I think that we are already doing. We're, you know, since the pandemic, there's been mutual aid that has been popped up all over the place. Some of it comes and goes, but millions of people have been involved in that. And we need to sit back and really reflect upon that and to start asking our questions, our, ourselves a question, how can we move from our small little groups, you know, to aggregate with a group that may be on the other side of Brooklyn or the other side of New York, right? Or upstate New York, you know, or, or in Massachusetts or even down here, right? How do we create the value chains and the supply chains that are going to be necessary to rearticulate the economy? And it starts with us, I think, really analyzing what we're already doing and figuring out how to aggregate and politicize it. So part of the question may be interrogating what you're already doing and figuring out how to connect that with other efforts. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that and totally in favor of creating those statewide or regional networks of people who are interested in doing shared work because it's hard to do things if you're just doing them on that hyper local level. Um, Ricardo, I'm gonna pass it to you and then we've got a couple more questions to you before we log off. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think part um, of what the, the documentary does very well is show that there's a lot of different opportunities and entry points for, all, for everyone based on your particular interest and passion. Um, and just to pick up on the last point that Kali was saying um, is investigate what you're doing or, um, already is if you're working in a nonprofit, there's no reason that you can't also democratize that workplace. Like we are out here, nonprofits are out there trying to dismantle these systems of oppression and then we are recreating them within our own workplaces. Um, so looking at the nonprofit industrial complex and starting to figure out how can we subvert this system, um, at least on our um, each organizational level. So that's that's one thing. And, and um, we work with organizations around the country to actually do trainings and share resources and learnings around how can we democratize the non nonprofit spaces. Um, I think the, uh, another thing that, that comes to mind, I saw somebody pop in a question about gig workers and so much of the economy is moving towards this independent contractor gig worker um, um, space um, is that there are, uh, or what was it? Um, gig cooperatives or basically uh, where where all these independent contractors are coming together to create uh, basically a shared brand where they can be owners of it um, as opposed to giving that cut to um, Uber or TaskRabbit or these other platforms. Um, so that's, that's being created in different spaces and the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives is actually working on incubating a particular type of gig cooperative that can provide some um, other support services to those workers. Um, so that'll be coming um, in, I think next year or something like that. So those are a few different ways. And the last thing, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. If you know somebody who owns a business, if they're looking to retire, this it's really difficult to be running that stuff. I know, um, like just tell them about cooperatives, you know, just like offer this as something for them as an opportunity. So if they're looking to sell, that they sell to their workers instead. And there's a host of organizations around the country who do that type of work to support those transitions. So, um, so yeah, well, that's how, that's some of the ways that you can get involved. Thank you. Um, you also should join DSA, join your local, local DSA chapter, and you should get organized with a tenant union in your building, which is really easy to do. Um, talk to your neighbors. Um, DSA has a tenant organizing toolkit. That I don't know that if I gave it to Dave, but if I didn't, I'll just make sure folks who registered get it. Um, you should organize a tenant union where you live. It's really a fun thing to do. Get to know your neighbors, fight back against your landlord. You know, maybe one day you could own the building yourselves. Um, all right. So Next question for the team. Um, what role do unions play in building worker power to develop cooperative ownership and then hopefully move beyond that to socialism? Um, I think we've touched on this a little bit tonight already about that relationship between, between unions and um, 
on cooperatives. Um, but yeah, does any, any of our panelists want to take a stab at answering that question? Uh, I, I would say that unions are great at building solidarity. And I only say that because someone gave me the answer of unions a few years ago when I, I said that so many of the socialists I, I know in the movement are, are nerds. And how do we get more non-nerds to be socialists? And they responded, well, well unions. Obviously, teach somebody about solidarity and how you work together um, in the form of class struggle. And you may not call it class struggle. You may just understand that you know, the boss is making a dollar, you're making a dime, and that's kind of messed up. But the, it, it builds class consciousness to um, have those unions. And in addition to that, it's great for unions to be in conversation with each other. You know, DSA has done great work about strike solidarity. And you know, even at times when I was a teacher, I, I joined, uh, pick, spoke on the picket lines of other unions to say in, in solidarity, you know, we are workers together. And if you're getting a raw deal, that means I am getting a raw deal. Yeah, Callie, Ricardo, Yael, you wanna weigh in on this question of how unions and cooperatives complement each other? Yael, did you wanna touch on that? Like, no? <laughs> um, well, I think let's, let's be real about the, the, the here and now. Um, which is that they are not complementing each other to the greatest extent that they they could and they should. Um, so you know, it, I think it's our job to start from uh, the concrete and then move from there. Um, um, one, I think we need to uh, have a serious conversation uh, with each other about how we need each other and that we're not going to advance without each other. Um, you know, at, at right now, um, I'm gonna I'm a commit one of the treasons that I hate, uh, which is to talk about the co-op sector. So the co-op sector and uh, organized labor, uh, we are both too minuscule uh, in our kind of organized form at present. Uh, I think to really exert the type of power that we should as a coherent uh, force uh, representing the working class. Uh, and that is an organ organizing question. It's an organizing challenge. Um, and part of what we have to really, I think, have an open dialogue and engagement with a lot of the union leadership. And I make a distinction between the leadership and like rank and file members uh, in this case, uh, that co-ops are not inherently co-opetition uh, with them in their position, you know, within the, the, the labor market in the greater economy. Uh, and that where we should be complementing each other is actually striving towards democratizing our workplaces, which means also striving for cooperative ownership. And, and that is where a critical piece of the struggle with the union leadership uh, I think takes place because sadly, many of them are, uh, see themselves in many regards as, as, as either an extension of the companies that they are with, uh, right? That, that um, they have to kind of uh, make certain concessions given their, the weakness of where they find themselves, you know, now say relative to 30 or 40 or 50 years ago um, to try to protect American jobs uh, from overseas competition or other forms of competition uh, rather than trying to see and form bonds of unity between all workers wherever they are to cut off capital's ability to manipulate us all in different forms and fashions. And we have to have a real honest dialogue uh, with the union leadership, uh, I think, about meeting that challenge. Now, at the same time, we need to be engaged in concrete, practical organizing drives and campaigns uh, of mutual respect and mutual benefit with rank and file workers, right? So where they are engaged in struggle, we should be there. Those of us in the co-op sector, we should be there uh, engaging in solidarity and advancing, uh, you know, the best of our ideas about uh, let's not just 
argue for better wages and work conditions, those are, are important, but let's not, you know, let's raise the, the, the question about cooperatizing this place, right? Uh, uh, transforming its ownership. Like, let's put that on the agenda and the table. And I think we need to have a conversation that meets both ends, uh, but it's going to require us and, and forces like DSA being very clear about engaging in, in that argument and engaging in that dialogue uh, in an open and, and principled and democratic way, knowing that, you know, there, there's going to be some level of hostility that we will meet by certain forces. But I think we should be prepared to engage that, not back down from it and recognize that this is one of the real arguments about, you know, uh, how we transform society that we're not going to be able to skip over, that we're going to have to struggle through in order to get to where we want to go. Yeah, absolutely. Any more thoughts on this question um, before we move on to the next one from the audience? Um, and again, we've got until about 925 for questions. And um, I wanna encourage folks to put questions in the chat. So we've got about 10 minutes left. So any pressing questions, put them in the chat. I'll just say about the union co-op relationship piece is that um, one of the things that I'm seeing uh, from my friends who are union organizers, um, is the kind of deep disillusion with a lot of union members and actually being able, like understanding what the union is doing, like well, uh, the participation of members between contract negotiations and that basically there's not really a lot of engagement. And so how do they democratize the unions themselves and create more participation from the members? Um, and I think what cooperatives can do is be uh, if we can be in conversation with those folks is we've learned a lot of lessons. We've made a lot of mistakes and the unions don't need to make those same mistakes as they're trying to democratize and, and create more participatory structures for unions themselves. And I don't want to put all the blame on unions um, because this is structural. Like the laws that have um, what uh, legalized unions um, and collective bargaining were created not to increase worker power. They were created to uh, make the stream of commerce move effectively like forward, that's it. And so when you look at the Wagner Act and the Na National Labor Relations Board, the function of those things is not to build worker power. And so part of what worker cooperatives can do is provide um, the lessons that we've learned and be working in partnership with, with folks who are um, engaging members and trying to organize workplaces um, so that we can share the lessons that we've learned and be be taking these steps down this path together. All right, so I think we have time for um, one, maybe two more questions. Um, so the first one is, I want to know from y'all, how might a worker-owned co-op be financed on a large scale without relying on the private financial industry? And what might this finance, uh, financing ecology look like? Specifically, who would make the financing decisions and how would how would the co-op get access to the capital it needs to, to really thrive? I could start with this one. Um, yeah, the, so there's a lot of different ways that we can do this. A lot of uh, the states that do have cooperative entities, um, like a legal cooperative entity for the state, typically have some cap on return uh, for investment. So cooperatives can still have outside investors, but they have limited participation or voting rights, and they have a cap on the extraction of wealth from those workplaces. Um, so that's one is that individuals would still be able to invest in them. Um, but also like looking at really innovative models, like the working world has created um, this project called the Seed Commons that are creating regional loan funds that are actually democratically controlled by um, community-based organizations around the country, and they decide what cooperatives to invest in. And so the working world provides seed capital, and then the investments happen in, co in local cooperatives, and the money, the return that happens can be reinvested. And so looking at how can we democratize finance and capital is gonna be a necessary component for us to um, really move forward. On top of the policy work that um, folks around the country have been doing, I mean, New York City was one of the early big wins for investing in worker cooperatives and seeing just an explosion of worker cooperative businesses and organizations in New York because of that city funding. Um, so those are gonna, those are, there's lots of different pathways and avenues. Um, and those are just a few. Oh, thanks. 
Anyone else want to weigh in on this question? I mean, one of the things that we've been struggling with on this question is unions, actually, you know, and, and really trying to uh, um, impress upon some of our uh, union allies uh, that their various, you know, kind of investment funds, because most unions have those, almost all unions have those, um, that they need to redirect a lot of those uh, resources uh, and invest them in the development, you know, uh, of, of things that they can own and control and not just pour that money into uh, financial markets, which, you know, are designed to actually undermine and, with, and weaken their power. Um, that is a longer term argument by, by far. Uh, we've been trying to have this conversation now for seven years with uh, mixed returns, both on a local and a regional uh, level. Um, but it's one that for sure we're not going to give up on because we, we, you know, for us, there's a political point around moving to where working people are, are financing our own endeavors. Um, and this is not to be opposed to any other strategy, but there's a political point. And a, and a point around transforming our own consciousness that we are trying to endeavor here to get people to understand and to utilize, you know, the, the, our collective power uh, to be able to move what we want to move. And so it's one that I know we're going to continue pursuing. And I would encourage folks wherever you are, you know, uh, to, to engage in those conversations, you know, along with the, the long term strategy and development. Because, um, look, I mean, from from my vantage point. Uh, uh, I don't think we leave any stone unturned, but, you know, the, the market and the forces of capital are not going to uh, endow us with the resources to undermine them in the long term, right? Uh, they'll give us maybe enough room to breathe, to operate, uh, to wiggle and, and, and struggle, but at some point, uh, we're going to have to come to grips about us financing us, uh, you know, and what that is going to take, what type of sacrifices, what type of self-organization is that going to take to really make this move? Yeah. All right. So one last question, and then we're going to close out. Um, so for, you know, over the last months, um, one of the strongest bargaining chips for higher wages was the refusal of folks to work during the pandemic because of health concerns, because of whatever concerns. Um, and with unemployment benefits recently cut off just a few weeks ago, a week ago, how can we keep this momentum up in the face of such strong opposition and such strong need? Um, how much greater and more violent will the capitalist reaction against serious advances um, towards socialism be? And what what do you what do you all expect? And and where should we go from here? Um, and again, this is our final question, so I'll ask each panelist to answer it. Um, try and take you know about a minute so we can close out and get everyone off here by nine thirty. And I'll start with Jabari. Sure. Thank you. So I think with while unemployment benefits were going, you got a chance for a lot of bosses and employers to reckon with the fact that they were not paying people enough. And maybe they didn't reckon it, maybe they would put a sign on their window saying no one wants to work anymore. I'm sure many of you have seen that a photo, it's, it's like some fast food agency says we can't hire any workers, no, no one wants to work anymore. And, and truly no one wants to work for starvation wages anymore, especially when unemployment, you know, was giving them enough benefits to, to survive. So there's that. I have been noticing, you know, I've been seeing a lot of like articles and, and just trends of people uh, looking for alternate work or just resigning, you know, being fed up with, uh, you know, the their, their life they had before COVID and before we had a, a massive, shake up. I think it is time to continue pushing for deeper wages. I think we can let up on the fact that the wealthy have increased their wealth by over a trillion dollars um, in, in the pandemic, because, you know, whenever you hear pushback about, you know, increasing in wages, you know, harming businesses, that's that's simply not true because wages have increased for, for the 1%. And I don't get wages per se, but their pay has increased for the one percent. Jabari Ricardo. Um, 
Sorry, can you say the question one more time? Because I'm just like trying to, I was like trying to wrap my head around everything you were saying. And then you said the question. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, with yeah. unemployment benefits recently cut off, how are we going to keep up this momentum um, against exploitative wage labor, basically? Um, and what do we think opposition will look like? How is our opposition going to get more violent? And what should we do? <laughs> what should we be doing now that there's no unemployment? <laughs> Yeah, I um, I think uh, one thing we should we should definitely be um, trying to figure out how to organize and come together um, and fight those types of uh, reductions in relief. But I also think that one thing that the pandemic showed, particularly at the beginning, was the emergence of mutual aid networks and just like the fact that communities came together and took care of themselves, like we take care of us. And so I think that's something that we can start to, to build on those networks that were created, those relationships that were created and figure out ways to um, use those relationships and, and networks to support this, this movement of uh, fighting against these uh, like austerity cuts and, and other ways, neoliberal types of responses to, um, to our current conditions. Yeah, it's been really amazing. Thank you, Callie. We have to take a lesson from the right on this. And I think that is politicizing the pandemic. I don't think we've done enough of that. I think we've been on the defensive uh, relative to the pandemic. And I think we have to polit politicize it uh, and make some real sharp and clear distinctions. Like, are we for health and humanity or are we just, you know, uh, uh, for running the economy till we're all dead. I mean, because those are, are literally the two choices. And I think the right has been very clear about that. I mean, let's not forget that they were arguing this time last year that old folks should just sacrifice themselves for the economy, right? That, that people would, you know, either because either they were allegedly prepared to die, which no old folk, I, old people I know were prepared to die, uh, or they were just going to be sacrificed. And clearly, um, I mean, there's a coherent strategy uh, being pushed by, you know, the right at the level of, of state governance, you know, Florida, Texas, I think being kind of the tip of the spear in this regard, they are clearly following uh, a herd immunity uh, strategy at this point. They haven't called it that. I think their own focus groups and studies said back off that wording, but in policy, that is actually what they're, that's actually what they're moving forward. Uh, hell, that actually might win. Uh, their arguments, you know, I don't think they're going to win in California, uh, but the fact that they've gained as much traction as they have with this argument coming from Larry Elder should tell us something. And I think we have to politicize it back and then use that as a test case for like, look, let's make the arguments about the society we want, not just settle for the best that we can get, but like we have to totally restructure society, you know, with health care. Uh, and healthy living being in the lead. And then what does that look like? How does that entail? How do we produce that? That is where I think we need to be leading this charge and this fight right now. Uh, and I think it will resonate even amongst forces, uh, amongst the right, um, you know, who are just being uh, bewildered with, with you know, uh, misinformation, um, you know, constant bombardment. I don't think we're doing a good enough job to, to really countering that and leaving that up to MSNBC and, and CNN is not a winning ticket for us. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we got to put in our work and do, do the grassroots work of politicizing this. And I think we'll have a much different outcome. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll leave the final word to you, then we're going to out. And thanks everyone for joining. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess to pick up, I don't think we should be leaving anything to MSNBC or CNN. Uh, yeah, so I can't, can't really top that. Um, I'm not feeling too hopeful these days, uh, but I can say um, just, you know, if you are in film or documentary, you're like, please reach out to me because I am actually doing and creating a working group uh, around organizing, whether that's a co-op or something else is, TBD, um, and you should go to socialismovie.com where you can find links to rent the film. We are doing community screenings um, with different organizations. Um, we would love to come and speak to your organization. The people that are in the film would love to come and do a panel um, for you, with you. 
And um, yeah, I don't know. Thank you guys so much. I know that I learned a lot and was taking notes. Um, so thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. And I am at um, our time tonight is up. So that doesn't mean that the conversation is over. Please do reach out, as Yael mentioned, go check out the film, reach out to any of our organizations to get involved. Um, I also wanna thank everyone who's involved in bringing this event together. Of course, Yael, the filmmaker of the big scary S word, um, my fellow panelists, our co-sponsors, our audience and discussants. And everyone, you will all be receiving um, follow-up emails about this event and other upcoming events you can get involved with and join. Thank you so much for your great questions and comments in the Q&A box. And thank you also to everyone on the YouTube and the Facebook Live and the Twitter and the blah, 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 who are watching, who we, we can't see them, but they are here. Um, I want to thank Flynn Murray from Descent Magazine, Sunshine, Michael, David, and Priscilla from the Democratic Socialists of America Fund. Um, and, you know, I know the panelists tonight have really given us all a lot to think about um, and some clear direct actions we can take in our workplaces and in our homes to fight for economic democracy. We are um, in the follow up email to this event, which you will get if you registered, will include a link to the video and that video will also be on the DSA fund YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to. Um, so subscribe to the YouTube channel, share that video widely, and please do get involved in some local opportunities for action that, that everyone spoke about tonight. Organize your workplace, form a cooperative, organize your home, and, you know, have a, have a good night. Thanks, everybody, so much for joining.